All right, welcome everyone uh, to the NIFTY webinar on cooperative farming, best practices and challenges, hosted by the National Incubator Farm Training Initiative uh, with presenters Vanessa Bransberg from the Democracy at Work Institute and Mai Nguyen from the California Center for Cooperative Development. My name is Brianna Bowman and I am the National Farmer Training Networks Manager at the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project which is the organization in Boston, Massachusetts that houses the National um, Incubator Farm Training Initiative. So before I pass things over to Vanessa and Mai, I want to give a little overview of NIFTY for folks that may be new to the network. Um, so the National Incubator Farm Training Initiative was formed in 2012 and we provide support to the staff of incubator farm projects across the country. Um, this support looks like one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. We also develop resources um, and host events in support of the professional development of incubator farm project staff nationwide. There are many ways to connect with NIFTY, so if you have questions about um, program operations or implementation, um, please feel free to find the intake form on our website to sign up to receive free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance from our network of TA providers. Uh, we also have a listserv um, that is active with members from incubator farms across the country. The uh, membership of the listserv is at 300 people now, so it's a great place to, throw, to float your curiosities about um, what's happening in your project and to seek advice from other folks doing similar work nationwide. We also host a national field school every year. Um, this coming year, we'll be hosting the field school in Denver, Colorado in November. The date is to be determined, um, but you can stay tuned on the listserv for more information about that opportunity. Um, also, as you're aware, we host a webinar series. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our website, um, so you can share it with folks that weren't able to make it today. And we also encourage you to check out our resource library, which includes um, a lot of really practical um, tools that can be used in uh, program delivery. These range from curriculum tools to guides related to farmer handbooks. And then if there's anything you don't see there and you're curious about, please feel free to shoot me an email. My um, email is listed on that site and we can do some digging to find resources to support your program. The last thing I want to bring up is that NIFTY um, has established regional networks that have quarterly calls led by regional conveners in five regions throughout the country. And participation in the national listserv will keep you updated um, as to the happenings in your region as well. Um, so enough about NIFTY. Let me talk a little bit about our curiosity about cooperative development and why we're really excited to have Mai and Vanessa with us today. So as the NIFTY community of practice has evolved, conversations around what a successful outcome for participation um, have kind of budded amongst the NIFTY community. And part of what we have drawn into question is, um, is the sole proprietorship business owner model the only possibility um, for success for an in incubator participant? And resoundingly, the answer has been no. There are a number of opportunities for participants to be successful outside of that model. And one of the ways that folks um, have been interested in exploring different possibilities for their participants is through education around cooperatives. So we're very grateful to um, Mai and Vanessa for being willing to share their expertise on cooperatives today. And we hope that the webinar will not only um, work to make you a little more familiar with what some of the like cooperative um, values and principles are, but also how you can potentially fold some of these teachings into the incubator setting to kind of ease the transition of your farmers into the cooperative model if that's something that they're interested in pursuing after graduation. Um, so with that, I will pass things over to Vanessa and Mai. Um, and just a note that if you do have questions throughout the webinar, um, I would encourage you to submit them via the chat box because we will uh, review those at the end. Um, everyone is muted now to reduce background noise. So Vanessa and Mai, I will pass things over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Brianna. I really appreciate yeah. you having us today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hello, everybody. So my name is Vanessa Bransberg, uh, and I work at the Democracy at Work Institute. And I'm just going to do a brief introduction of who I am and uh, what 
Democracy at Work Institute, or DAWI is, and then I'll pass it over to my, um, and excuse, there's a little bit of background noise, so hopefully that'll end soon. Uh, so I um, I'm the Startup Initiatives um, Director at the Democracy at Work Institute, um, and I've been there for two years now. Um, my role there is basically to lead the Immigrant Cooperative Initiative, um, and I'm also a trainer, and I provide technical assistance um, to worker cooperatives around the country. Um, the Democracy at Work Institute is um, basically there to expand worker ownership um, and has a particular focus on uh, reaching communities that are most directly affected um, by social and economic inequalities, um, specifically people of color, recent immigrants, and low-wage workers. Um, and so we see ourselves as a think and do tank um, that basically looks to partner with uh, large organizations um, to move their missions forward and to be able to, to collaborate on projects together. Um, so some of the things that we do um, is we have a conversions program uh, where we work with a collaborative of um, technical assistance providers and other um, finance institutions that move deals forward around the country um, to bring traditional businesses to worker ownership. Um, so I have a few colleagues working on that. Um, we also have a, a research director um, that works very closely with the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, which is our sister organization where we were, we were born from. Um, that's about 11 years old, and it's the member base of, of the worker uh, cooperative community. Um, and we also uh, have some ecosystem organizing as well. We're very present, present in the New York City um, initiative um, project that's been going on now for over five years. Um, and then there's just other regions around the country that are really looking at um, mobilizing ecosystems to really make policy changes and build coalitions to build up um, their co-op development efforts um, and to increase the amount of worker co-ops on the ground and really look at scaling them um, with an equity focus many times. Um, so my work, um, like I said earlier, is focused on working um, with, with uh, new immigrants, with refugees around um, feeling less isolated and being able to share their um, lessons learned on the ground in their businesses um, to build leadership um, and to be able to mobilize to encourage others to, to build their own cooperatives. Um, and a, a, more recently, I've been um, sort of working on um, a, providing technical assistance and, and working with groups that are in rural areas um, to be able to bring this model um, to, to different areas in the country. Um, so I attended the field school um, recently and learned a lot about um, NISTI and many of your programs, so that was really, really interesting. And I thought that, um, you know, it would be really great to sort of, um, you know, build on the work that you all have been doing on looking at this model um, and take it to the next level. And so um, we brought mine um, to, to talk about that today. So I, um, I'll be available to answer questions as well about the work that we do at DAWI at the end and, and share some resources that we have. Um, yeah, thanks Vanessa for inviting me, also Bree uh, for having us both here today. So um, I was working at the California Center for Cooperative Development as a co-op development specialist. Um, my primary areas of focus were in the agricultural and worker cooperative sectors. Um, my background is that I uh, have been a farmer and still run a farm um, in Northern California in addition to, to having this position. Um, I had created a cooperative to run a business that um, was a restaurant that sourced from local farms prior to having, prior to farming. And then um, in my role as a farmer, uh, I have also created an equipment sharing co-op that I'll briefly touch on in a bit. So um, my non-co-op development hat is very much in the <laughs> food and agricultural world, and then um, as a co-op developer, I primarily work in rural areas on co-op development, and in particular, um, recently developing the worker cooperative farm model, which I'll be talking about today. So, um, oh yeah, and I'm also on the board of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives and, and support um, any of the rural cooperatives uh, who are members. So just getting a little bit further into um, 
the organization that I work for. The California Center for Cooperative Development is based in Davis, California. Um, it is a um, USDA designated co-op development center. So there are many of us across the country um, connected in a, a network called Cooperation Works. And um, that group would be a good resource for um, all of you across the country if you're looking to partner with um, co-op developers who have been working in rural areas um, and are familiar with the, the scope of many different kinds of co-ops. Um, so at the end, we'll close with with a map of um, with a map of co-op development centers who are across the country. But yeah, for us, you know, we um, have a mission of promoting cooperatives as a vibrant business model to address the economic and social needs of California's communities. Um, the reason why we have co-op development centers uh, in each region, each state, is that um, co-op statutes vary from state to state, and so it is uh, important to keep that in mind as you listen to the case studies that I bring up um, or look for other models of you know, uh, cooperatives as they apply to you know, your clients. Um, just keep in mind that there are different co-op statutes for each state, and so looking at a model in another state may not you know, uh, totally be able to uh, be replicated where you're at. Um, but uh, yeah, in our office, there, there are actually only three of us who are co-op developers. Um, and uh, towards the bottom there, there's Kim, our executive director, who focuses on uh, housing, worker, and child care cooperatives. Uh, Luis with the guitar, um, he focuses on food cooperatives, consumer co-ops. Um, and agricultural co-ops, and I already mentioned my areas. So if you are in California and you have any questions um, about any of those areas, you can reach out to our office, um, and my colleagues can hopefully be of help. Um, so for today, uh, though I, I understand that um, NIFTI already had a uh, workshop on Cooperatives. I just wanted to get us on the same page again, just a, a brief refresher. Um, and then I'll go into examples of worker cooperative farms um, and how they might apply to you know, the curriculum that you're working with at your respective centers. Um, and then going into agricultural co-ops, many of them are, the, the ones that people know about are quite large, and so I wanted to give examples of um, ways that small-scale farmers and beginning farmers have adopted the agricultural cooperative model. Um, and then, just I, to wrap up for my part, I just want to mention um, ways that you can incorporate cooperation into um, incubators or business practices, even if you don't fully go into you know, forming a, a cooperative. And before I get into the rest of the slides, um, Earlier we mentioned, uh, we were talking with three, that if you have any clarifying questions, you're welcome to type them in. Um, but any kind of questions that need further elaboration or further examples, that we'll, I'll take them at the end. So what is a co-op? <laughs> um, so this is oftentimes what um, people think of when I say that I'm a co-op developer especially in Northern California, where there are a lot of back to the landers. And um, <laughs> so there's this vision that you know a co-op is sort of a carefree collective of people where there's very little structure and um, much more whim, uh, whimsy. But, um, but I just want to get into the definition that how that co us co-op developers work with, which is that a cooperative is a business, one that you incorporate as, you know, there is a specific tax code for cooperatives, and that when you form a cooperative business, you are filing with the state, um, and that this business is providing a specific service to its membership. So that service um, you know, is what that you know, it's the purpose of that business, and maybe there are um, ex 
external or additional services that um, kind of emerge from people working together. So um, for a, you know, a, a worker cooperative, the services that it's, it's providing um, jobs for people, and maybe as they're working together, they discover they have common needs around childcare, and maybe they coordinate that together. But the childcare would not be a part of the business. That would be, you know, just something that um, is an emergent um, arena for cooperation. But again, is not a service provided by the business necessarily. Um, and then the idea that it it's a service provided provided to its membership is that there's a core group of members in a worker co-op, they're the worker owners. In a food co-op, you know, those are the shoppers who sign up to be a member. Um, so the business is accountable to that membership. And, um, and at cost, so when I say that, it's not to say that um, cooperatives are nonprofits. They are, when you incorporate as a co-op, officially it is a for-profit, but at cost is to say that um, you're not um, having to pay for additional services of like brokers, middle people, you're paying for the cost of that labor, the cost of production, the cost of running a business. So um, yeah, please keep in mind that this is the definition that we'll be operating off of throughout this presentation. Uh, some core components of co-ops across the board, uh, worker, agricultural, any of these sectors, um, is that each member has one vote. And the value of their vote is not proportional to how much equity or investment that they have in the co-op. Um, so this allows for ensuring that people really have a democratic process, an equal say in this arena in which they all have a stake. Um, profit is distributed in proportion to use. So um, oftentimes I get this question of like, oh, well, you know, what if you're in a worker cooperative and um, someone works far more hours than somebody else? Um, are you getting paid the same amount? Are you getting the same profits? And the answer is no in terms of the profit. Um, profit is, again, distributed in proportion to use. So say someone who's full-time they're working 40 hours and someone else is working 20 hours, so that's half. Um, then the profits would be such that the person who's working full time would get you know, proportionally twice as much as the other person in this um, very simplified <laughs> model. Um, and then regarding, we'll get into the sort of the wages in a worker co op later, but um, going back to these core components that all co ops share. Um, the co-op model also helps avoid double taxation because either um, the co-op is taxed on the profit or an individual when it's distributed to them, uh, as opposed to, say, a corporation where the corporation would be taxed on it and then once it's distributed, the individual would be taxed on it as well. Um, so that's another uh, difference. And, um, you know, that's identified in the IRS tax code, and a co-op is a T corporation, so that's, if you want to get deep into that, you can um, uh, look into that arena. Um, there's also this limitation on non-member business. Again, if this co-op is a business uh, providing a service for, service for its members, and so, um, you know, the focus is on providing um, services, accountability to its membership, and there may be some non-member business, but it's quite limited. Um, the non-member business might be a way to, um, you know, serve your community a bit more. It might the co-op might be, say, like this equipment sharing co-op uh, that I'm a part of for grain cleaning, and um, there may be some people who just some farmers who just need a one-time. Um, you know, seed clean, and we can do that just because uh, we're already in the area and want to serve uh, folks. And um, uh, it also is an extra um, way to, to make a profit for the, the co-op. And the last point that I want to bring up is this piece about cooperation between cooperatives. 
Um, this has actually proven to be a very valuable core principle because um, with the cooperative model or any like new business starting, um, you, know, you want to be able to learn from other people's experiences and being able to talk with other cooperatives who uh, can provide guidance, um, you know, share uh, bookkeeping templates. That's been very helpful for, for startups. And so that's also something to keep in mind as you may be helping groups um, form cooperatives is just asking other cooperatives, you know, what have you done? And, you know, do you mind, you know, just taking a moment to, to talk with these people who are interested in forming a co-op um, to just have a better understanding. Um, and on, even on a more tangible level, um, there are many groups of co-ops that have formed to provide not just um, technical assistance, but also financial lending, um, which we may get into a little bit later, but um, that's really key, right, is this sort of investment that cooperatives are making in other cooperatives. Um, so I just wanted to just give people a reminder of all the different types of co-ops that exist. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we forget that co-ops are already out there. Um, they're not just a, a, a niche idea or just a concept. So, um, sorry, there's some grinding noise outside. I hope you can still hear me okay. I mean, you can raise your hand if you can't. But um, anyway, so you know there are large ones such as REI. That's a purchasing co-op. There are uh, food co-ops around the country. They're very, typically very regional. Um, credit unions, all of all credit unions are cooperatives. So that's also a, a key resource um, for consideration for lending and um, financial advising uh, for, for co-ops to, to ask credit unions. Um, uh, there are artisan co-ops. They have their own uh, statutes typically. There are housing cooperatives, also known as limited equity housing. Um, they are, limited equity housing is oftentimes set up as a cooperative. And then you have um, these uh, sort of century-old uh, agricultural co-ops out there, like Sunsweet, Sunmade, Treetop, um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you can think of many in your grocery store shelves. So um, again, this first part, I just want to focus on the worker cooperative model. Um, this arena has um, has not uh, has had the same kind of um, prevalence as the other models, but I just wanted to bring up some of them in different sectors just so that maybe you can be alerted to them in your own community or region. So in um, Berkeley, there's the Cheese Board Collective. They run a pizza store and a, a cheese and bread shop. Um, you know, through their worker ownership over the past 30-plus um, years, um, it's been cool to see how they really take care of their workers and have even taken their profits and invested in a, a lakeside um, vacation house <laughs> that they share. Um, there's Isthmus Engineering. They're in Madison, Wisconsin. They're an engineering firm. And so, you know, sometimes I get the question about can worker cooperatives really scale and be big? You know, this one has, um, you know, 50 plus employees who are engineers, and they are a internationally uh, well-known engineering firm that create um, machines that make machines. <laughs> um, I'm bringing up Rainbow Grocery. They're a worker co-op that's interesting because for a grocery store, there are all these different departments, and each department actually has its own governance of uh, sort of a worker co-op within the larger worker co-op. And lastly, there's Design Action Collective. So they are a web design and graphic design um, business, and they are worker owners and have um, created designs such as like the Black Lives Matter um, logo. So yeah, this is just an overview of different sectors that worker cooperatives are, are just thriving in. So in the worker cooperative model, um, workers own and govern the business. 
right? So they make an investment. Typically, when you join a worker cooperative, there's an equity contribution, which you can think of as um, buying into the business, right? So say um, a business costs $10,000 initially, like a way to think about the buy-in and, and uh, a sort of ballpark of what an equity contribution would look like is if it's $10,000 and there are five people in this cooperative, uh, maybe their equity buy-in would be 2000 So that would cover the cost of being a part of the business. So workers have an investment um, in the business. They also are part of, are part of the decision-making of the governance of that business. Um, and we'll get into the difference between governance decisions and operations decisions as I go through the case studies. Um, but at the core, you know, they are making decisions about um, the overall uh, budget or terms of membership, who can become a worker owner, um, who um, the terms of um, termination, and um, and then they they're part of deciding what the structure of that business will be. Right, so um, that's a, the governance piece is codified in the bylaws, and then there are also um, operational agreements, which some depending on the size of the worker co-op um, and sort of division of sectors, there may be um, operations uh, agreements and policies that are designed by sectors or by the, the worker co-op as a whole. So that's the general overview of how worker co-ops are structured. Um, and so I just want to get into some of these um, worker cooperative farms that um, I've been a part of assisting. So this is Flying V. They are um, based in Placerville, California, which is just outside of Sacramento. And they incorporated um, just three weeks ago and bro broke ground on their new farm um, yeah, two weeks ago. So I've been working with them for a year and a half and it really started um, with a conversation with these, the two brothers in this photo, Cody Curtis and Grayson Curtis. And um, they're farming in Nevada City, also sort of just outside of Sacramento. And they had been farming for five years on various farms, and were getting to the point where they wanted to set up, you know, own their own farm business and um, dedicate themselves to growing perennials, which also meant that they would want to move toward owning land. Um, and they also knew that they needed more people uh, involved to have the diversity of skills necessary to run a farm, right? Because it's not just knowing how to farm, but it's also having um, marketing skills, um, business planning, and bookkeeping skills. And um, yeah, they they thought about their possible uh, entity options, and um, you know, they, they decided, you know, neither of them wanted to be bosses, but they also didn't want to be just employees. And so um, when they were reading through different uh, entity options, they came across the co-op model. And they, they said that that really resonated with them, is that there are people who are uh, working together, um, valuing each other's skills, and uh, collaborating to, to really operate this farm uh, from drawing from all of these rich, deep experiences. So they invited um, other farmer friends in the area that they already had working relationships with to be a part of the conversation. And um, they originally started with six people um, until it got to the point where uh, they needed to identify land and, and basically ground the conversation in, okay, how much is it going to cost? Um, you know, what kinds of markets will we have available to us at a particular place, right? It's hard to do any kind of business planning when you don't have a foundation. And so um, 
you know, this is really important to consider is if you do talk with any of your um, you know, participants at the incubator about, you know, co-op development or starting a business, I'm sure you already do this, is just sort of like, where are you going to be working from? And so once they identified um, the piece of land that they wanted to pursue, um, they um, became more dedicated to the co-op development process so that they could be an entity before um, signing a lease for, for the place that they would be at. Um, so that's where I came in as a co-op developer was in assisting them to um, you know, work through their bylaws very rigorously. We um, had weekly check-ins where they would go through a section of the bylaws each week, submit it to me, I would review it, and then give it back to them. Um, ultimately, um, then they sent it to an attorney, which um, provided the final say. So in terms of the support that they received, you know, there was kind of a, a network of professionals who knew about co-ops to assist them. And also this photo was taken at the California Co-op Conference, um, which our center hosts every year. And um, they've kind of made it a tradition of theirs to attend each year. And um, they've just they've said that it's been incredibly valuable as a way to meet other professionals and other people in cooperatives to learn from them. Um, and in particular, this past year, um, our keynote speaker was Carol Zippert of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, who has been around since 50, for the past 50 years, and um, have done a great deal in developing a whole like co-op ecosystem from financing to farmland access. Um, and so it really, to them, they said it just really helps them understand sort of this um, co-op movement that they're a part of that they can also learn from. And so for, for those of you out on the East Coast, there's also the um, Eastern Worker Co-op Conference. Um, there's a National Worker Co-op Conference that um, is every two years, uh, hosted by the U.S. Federation and DOWI. So that's just something to keep in mind if you have uh, participants who are curious about worker co-ops and want to be exposed to more people. Those are some um, good resources. So um, yeah, with, with Flying V, they are a small, well, they're a diversified farm and they're, they're farming on two acres of vegetable, but they also have 60 acres of um, grapes and apples that they're managing as well. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that came out of this process that I thought was fascinating about like why it's not just why they became a worker co-op but what has emerged that, that they appreciate about being a worker co-op is they said that they they like being able to just be their full selves um that there isn't a job description that they have to try to fit into but that they already know what the the goal is they're trying to create this business and um, that they get to be, they get to express and exercise the things that they're excited about um, in relation to this business rather than having to fit into a particular um, position that has been determined by someone else. So Lucy can be orchard manager, um, animal uh, manager, and social media because she's really good at all those things rather than having to fit into a particular job description where she's doing things that she might not be very good at um, and not excited about. And so, um, yeah, they just said that they just appreciate how the worker co-op model allows them to be full humans <laughs> in a humanizing uh, work environment, and but that it also comes together so that they can all thrive in this business. Um, so this next group, uh, Cloverleaf Farms, they're based in Dixon, California. So um, this is now um, south of Sacramento. Uh, most of these farms are in the sort of Davis, Sacramento Valley area. Cloverleaf Farm um, 
actually was operated by Emma Torbert. She's on the far right in the blue shirt. Um, she ran that starting nine years ago, and um, she leases land to grow um, uh, stone fruit. And um, four years ago, uh, Katie, who's next to Emma in the photo, came along and they became partners in running this business. Um, their business is doing really well. They sell to the local food co-op. They have a CSA of um, over 60 members. They sell to many um, value-added uh, processors in the area who you know, sell in San Francisco. And um, so in terms of their business financing and um, market growth, they're doing really well. And so they've been able to bring on uh, more employees, but as they expand, they they wanted employees to have an opportunity to share in um, the the profits, but also to share in the risks, right? So um, they're working together year round, um, and they also do value added processing. They do they make some nectarine salsas, and they have dried fruit. Um, and so in this year-round operation, they wanted to have to enable people to um, to have this year-round employment as well as just having a greater stake in the business. And so they approached us about converting their business from this partnership to uh, a worker cooperative. Um, they have been working with a group called Kitchen Table Advisors, which out here is a group that provides direct one-on-one uh, -on -one technical assistance um, around business development for um, farmers who've been running a business for three years or more. And so in collaboration with them, um, we've been providing trainings on you know, what a cooperative is, uh, their entity choice, um, choices, uh, governance and financing, and um, they have, uh, originally they, they felt a lot of pressure to try to convert by January. Um, so this is something that has come up a lot for us. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's like people um, have, have some dates in mind where it's like, okay, I need to be a, become a business by January because, um, for, because of tax reasons. So if this ever comes up, um, <laughs> Uh, reminding them that well, taxes will always be complicated no matter when you incorporate, and um, just having a network, working with a network of other um, technical assistance providers um, and you know farm development professionals really helps to um, to keep the farmers kind of grounded and understanding the pathway towards creating a, a farm business. So, um, so yeah, this conversion is one that would allow them to expand, and um, we're just finishing the trainings process and um, getting deeper into developing a draft of that set of bylaws for them. Uh, another group that I want to talk about is uh, the Bahati Mamas Cooperative. Um, they're in San Diego, and um, this. Um, effort was a, a collaboration between California Center for Cooperative Development, um, the International Rescue Committee in San Diego, and also um, a, an environmental program out inside um, the Occidental University um, Environment and Social Policy Program uh, to assist with um, new Americans in in the furthering their farm enterprises. So this group of women actually originally were farming in an urban area of San Diego, um, up the street from where we are right now, and um, and they were they were farming on small plots um, and just had demonstrated that they were taking this business very seriously um, and needed to expand acreage. And so, um, uh, there was a incubator site identified um, in Northern County San Diego, 
where um, they carpool together and then farm at this incubator site as a worker cooperative. Um, for us as a co-op development center, we are able to apply for a federal grant called the Socially Disadvantaged Groups Grant. Um, that's within the USDA. Um, it allows us to assist not only with co-op development, but also with um, technical assistance on crop planning, um, organic certification, and other um, farming aspects. So that's something to keep in mind if you um, decide to partner up with a co-op development center um, to work with uh, socially disadvantaged groups. Um, yeah, co-op development centers um, are one of the few eligible ap applicants for that grant. Um, the grant uh, is up to uh, $200,000 and socially disadvantaged groups, if you're not unfamiliar with that terminology, um, it, uh, it applies to women, um, people of color, and veterans. And for a group to be considered a socially disadvantaged group, it has to be majority, um, a majority of socially disadvantaged designated people. Uh, so yeah, with this group, they were farming on 10 acres and mostly produced like mixed vegetables and um, there were six uh, worker owners and this operated for um, about six years but unfortunately um, the difficulty of maintaining it was because of the distance between where um, the worker owners lived which is in the city of San Diego and then um, where the incubator site was. So that's something to consider is, um, you know, how do you, if, if, an, if there's a site for incubation, you know, um, where is that relative to, to where people live, but also what is the long-term plan? Is there a possibility for transitioning the site to a place closer to place of residence or vice versa? And uh, the last example for worker cooperative farms is uh, Coke Farms. Coke Farm is actually um, a family farm that's been in operation for a few decades, and they have over 300 acres of vegetables um, and grain. They also operate a food distribution hub, and uh, the, the, the owners want to retire and pass their business on to their current employees. So. Um, for the incubators that I talk to, mostly on the West Coast, you know, sometimes they have participants who um, have been working on a farm and then are a part of an incubator and go back to uh, working on a larger farm. So one thing to consider is, you know, if uh, those participants learn about the co-op model, they could possibly go back to the farms that they were previously at and you know, bring this up with the farm owners if they are looking for building a succession plan or you know, just um, passing their business on to you know, non-family members, which I'm sure you see is increasingly the case. There are, there are fewer um, you know, children of farm owners who want to continue farming. So passing the farm on to the people who know how to run it best, um, the people who already work there, you know, is, is another option. So right now, um, Coke Farm is in discussion with um, our center, Project Equity, which is um, uh, an organization focused on uh, business conversions to worker cooperatives, um, and um, and also Kitchen Table Advisors, who I mentioned earlier. Um, they they're the ones who provide that direct one-on-one uh, -on -one assistance with farmers. So, um, so yeah, this is the just an example of the, the conversion model with succession in mind. Um, someone just mentioned, asked me to speak louder into the microphone. I don't know if this is making a difference. Um, but yeah, feel free to mention it again in the next coming slides. Um, do a time check. 
So um, I just want to also briefly go over the agricultural co-op model. Uh, these are the much larger agricultural co-ops that you might be familiar with um, as you know shelf products. Um, and the, the basic organization of that is that there is a broad membership. So say for any of those co-ops here, these are you know farmer-owned agricultural co-ops. So let's just focus on Organic Valley. For a so if you're a member of Organic Valley as a dairy farmer, uh, you would elect the board of directors. And the board of directors really manage sort of this policy and oversight of the co-op business. Um, and and so that sort of relieves the membership of sort of more active, active participation, um, or at least more frequent participation. And so then the board of directors hires the staff. So they hire a general manager, and the general manager hires employees. Um, so those employees are accountable to the manager, um, and then that manager is accountable to the board of directors, and then so going up stream from those arrows, then the board of directors are accountable to the, the total membership. Um, so I found this chart to be important for when I talk with uh, farmers looking to uh, form an agricultural co-op because they're often concerned like, well, is this just going to create more work for me? Um, and so something to keep in mind is like, well, People doing the work um, are actually going to be hired staff. Um, maybe at the initial stages, if you're a small group, there might be a working board, but um, but the the overall structure is such that you want to get to the point where you can hire the staff. Um, and this is you know what a lot of sort of these consumer co-ops are structured like as well. So if you're a part of a food co-op, this is pretty much the, the structure of accountability and governance and decision making that is um, within those businesses. So this is just another way of thinking about that system of accountability. And um, so just as an example of you know the ways that small scale farmers are using this model is um, so for for me as a small scale um, organic rare heritage grain grower. <laughs> I can't access um, and use um, the sort of conventional grain cleaning facilities um, in order to maintain the feed purity that I need and especially to operate at the scale that I need. So, you know, this is um, my co-op members and I standing in front of our harvest combine, which um, as you can see is pretty like human scale combine um, and is much smaller than you know the, the John Deere's that you see you know driving through Nebraska um, and so you know we formed because we we needed this scale appropriate um, equipment and the way that this may apply to incubators is that you know if you have farmers um, who maybe are uh, more senior in the program, and they want to um, procure, you know, special equipment or even just a tractor that they can use. You know, they could form a cooperative to purchase that equipment, um, and and that's something that could either stay on the incubator site, um, and as different, you know, students come through, they could become members of this co-op to have access to it. Um, or maybe it's a group that graduates together and like stays in the area and they can continue to own this equipment together. So this is just a, an option for you know small scale farmers who um, you know may not have the capital to have their own tractor um, but be able to, to share it with others. Um, also for people who are growing specialty crops, maybe there are farmers that you work with who are growing, you know, sort of culturally significant crops um, that don't have a large market already. So this group of farmers that I worked with in the Lucerne Valley of California, which is in the high desert region, um, there are 
uh, 50, there were 50, and now there are 60 farmers uh, growing jujubes, which are a culturally significant crop for um, East Asians. And, and they have been able to um, just be able to aggregate their product at a scale so that they can access more markets in Los Angeles, um, New York, Boston, and also um, apply for group gap which is, you know, a, a looming concern for many farmers is food safety compliance, and especially for English limited farmers, um, you know, how do you comply with food safety and deal with the bureaucracy and the documentation um, individually while forming a cooperative and um, applying for group GAP. It has been a um, cost-saving alternative for many of these farmers. And um, the last example I want to give is of um, food hubs that are converting to um, cooperative ownership. So uh, food hubs, you know, became quite popular six years ago. A lot of nonprofits were starting them up. And um, for several of them on the West Coast, they're finding that, you know, uh, that for nonprofits to operate these food hubs are sort of outside of the purview of these nonprofits or their long-term mission, but also that they've had this goal of being, um, you know, farmer-led, and so they figured, well, the ultimate way for these uh, food hubs to be farmer-led is for them to own it and govern it. And so uh, I've been working with several food hubs to convert to uh, um, farmer-owned cooperatives, um, and they function very much like uh, the old cooperatives that were the sort of start of, you know, American agricultural system, right, of small-scale farmers who were far apart from each other, aggregating their products at one site, uh, typically like a storefront um, in, a, in a larger town, um, and in these cases, you know, using modern technology and for, for web platforms to make sales and using um, you know, smaller semis to deliver the product. But um, yeah, but now they've, they're called food hubs instead of cooperatives, um, but these food hubs are looking towards these, these models that have been um, longstanding institutions for our agricultural system. Um, so for your participants, you know, if they get to a point where they want to sell produce together, um, maybe some of you already operate uh, kind of distribution and sales center from your incubator, um, you, you can, this is an option for looking at how farmers can participate. So um, kind of stepping away from just the more uh, the formal co-op model, if you want to start incorporating um, co-op principles um, or means of uh, working cooperatively into your um, incubator site. You know, one way to do it is to start by creating spaces of equal participation. Okay, so, um, so maybe the, you know, incubator participants don't have um, a say over everything, but maybe there are just some arenas where everyone is invited to participate as equals and in those spaces possibly to share and implement ideas, um, say around like new um, irrigation um, systems or um, schedules or, you know, different ways of harvesting. Um, you know, is there a place where people can equally share their um, suggestions and also brainstorm how to implement those ideas rather than having someone else direct, you know, how they should do it. And then, of course, once you're implementing it, um, what kinds of ways can people be accountable to each other, um, you know, as peers, and that there's an enforcement and follow through as peers rather than having, again, an external or um, hierarchical um, position where someone else um, who has greater authority is um, sort of dictating or 
um, ensuring that, um, that there's follow through. So when there's that horizontal accountability, there's, it fosters a greater feeling of empowerment and agency. And overall, you know, it just fosters um, creativity and growth and institutional improvement because then the people who are doing the work are the ones who are also um, providing this feedback of how, um, how the system can be improved. Um, going back to just thinking about the co-op business, so this is key to cooperative success. Of course, having sound finances, you can't have that business without um, being able to stay financially um, secure. Um, also making sure that goals and policies are very clear. You know, when working with a group of people, um, you just want to make sure that you're all working towards the same goals and um, following through uh, procedures um, that have already been predetermined. Um, you also want to ensure that you know you're working with people who are competent and reliable. Um, this is a really important consideration for startups when there hasn't necessarily been this call out with um, a job description um, or you know a employee vetting process hasn't been set up. But at least you know ensuring that the initial people that you're incorporating with um, are competent and reliable is very key. Um, and that's for the job, but in terms of, you know, running that business, having transparency in your accounting, um, honesty in, in not only your intentions, but also, you know, the, the operations that you've been running and accountability for, you know, what happens if things go wrong, what is the way that you're going to um, be able to address them, all of that is important. And in maintaining a co-op, you know, continuing education about what it means to be a co-op or what it means to run this business is essential. And, and relying on, you know, supportive advisors and having reliable resources are key to um, maintaining a successful cooperative. Um, so these are some of the things that our center provides assistance with. And this is also a typical suite of services that other co-op development centers assist with. Um, so if you're looking to um, partner with other um, technical assistance providers around co-op development, um, you know, feel free to check out your local co-op development center. And Vanessa, you have some broader resources to share? Yeah, so the first is um, a manual that was created um, to um, highlight cooperative farming um, that was a collaboration um, between a few different organizations including one of the cooperative development centers in the northeast called cooperative development institute um, i think they were the lead in, in sort of getting this um, manual going so we just passed it out actually at the field school and it would be great if you checked it out if you were interested in this topic further um, but i think uh, brie will probably send the link around now um, um, and then a, actually on the cooperative website, they have great resources to check out. So I just kind of highlighted this one around farm equipment sharing. Um, and just some, it's like a checklist um, to kind of go through around recommendations to do that. Um, and then just wanted to highlight again uh, what I brought up earlier, um, opportunities to meet other people that are engaging um, and working cooperatively. Um, so the more, uh, the one that's coming up sooner is uh, the, the California Cooperative Conference in San Diego actually where we are right now um, a, on April 29th, 30th. And so that's a um, cross-sector um, conference where uh, people usually come with ideas um, and they're really looking to, to understand the foundations of this business model um, and to exchange you know, information and, and make sure that they're linked up. Um, and then a little bit um, after that in September, we have the National Worker Cooperative Conference which this year is going to be in Los Angeles, California. Um, we usually alternate um, coasts, um, and that's an effort between the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops and Democracy at Work Institute. Um, and that um, is sometimes uh, more geared towards specific tracks of topics um, that um, go from kind of more beginners to more advanced level um, issues around conversions, 
um, ecosystem organizing um, in the past. There's all, and then there's sort of always a track around like the basics of running a business, um, which is great because it's led by worker owners themselves. Um, and then there's opportunities for people to gather informally and, and sort of have peer groups. Um, and that's where the U.S. Federation um, has their member the annual member meeting. So you're welcome to attend that and, and kind of get to know what that organization's doing, all the benefits they provide. And then below that is the map um, that I mentioned earlier um, that it comes from the Cooperation Works website um, that kind of gives you a sense of where uh, cooperative uh, centers are around the country so that um, we're hoping that actually <clears throat> following this webinar, we'll do another one that gets even more specific around topics of interest that you're, that you're thinking of as you're hearing all of this. Um, and that perhaps if you're thinking about integrating a, this work in what you're doing at your incubator, that you can start connecting with folks around you that can support your work and that are, you know, have expertise in, in cooperative development to supplement the work that you're doing a, with the farmers on the ground. So um, I think we just have the last slide that shows, you know, how to connect with us. And I think we're, we're ready to open it up and take questions. Great, thanks so much. And um, yeah, I would encourage anyone who has a question to go ahead and type it into the chat box. Um, there was a minute there where we lost connection to the chat. So if you did type a question, if you wanna copy and paste, that'd be great. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out, um, particularly about the equipment cooperative, is that one of NIFTY's technical assistance providers, the Intervale Center, runs a um, equipment sharing cooperative and is contracted with NIFTY to provide technical assistance on all aspects of their program, but has fielded many requests around this. So if that was something that piqued your interest, um, we can certainly connect you with them as a first step if you're just kind of exploring the possibility of how these things can work on the um, incubator space. So let's see. Um, uh, couple questions regarding um, kind of like first steps. So I'm wondering, Maya and Vanessa, for incubator um, farm staff that might be interested in introducing the opportunity um, of forming a cooperative to their participants who may have arrived in the program without a real strong understanding of it or thinking that they were interested in starting um, their own independent business, um, how would you recommend and when would you recommend kind of opening the conversation around the opportunity for cooperative formation? Um, I think um, you're in a really special role as this incubator um, where you know, you're providing um, guidance on you know, starting a business and um, how to run a farm, farm business and so I think you know, as you just even start talking about starting a farm business, um, just incorporating the co-op model into the suite of options is a good start. And then, you know, whenever, um, you know, business models and operating businesses comes up again in your curriculum or just in conversations, again, just bringing up cooperatives as just yet a normal, you know, part of the possibilities I think is really key, right? So. An issue for us is um, because of the sort of divestment from cooperatives on the federal level that's happened over the past uh, couple decades, just um, cooperative education has been eliminated from um, like small business development advising um, programs or even just in schools um, when it used to be a, just another standard part of the curriculum. So I think what's important is to just normalize this again as, hey, this is just another business option. Um, it is unique in its formation, but at the same time, in some ways, it's also not particularly special. <laughs> um, and also that, you know, the reason why we we're showing all these examples is that there are a lot um, of co-ops out there. And, and then outside of the U.S., it's even much more of a common practice um, and that's also been really helpful for me talking with sort of um, new Americans um, and you know talking with them they're like well yeah this is something that we are familiar with and the models that are often talked about by advisors um, 
know, farm business advisors uh, in the U.S., you know, that it's it's such a narrow scope that um, that is uh, almost particular to the U.S. Um, and uh, less relatable for for a lot of the new Americans who I work with. Just something small to add is um, something I've done is is if you have the opportunity to invite people from cooperatives to talk about um, like their story and and to answer questions, I think that that also says a lot. Um, so it's coming from you know those who are actually practicing. Um, so setting up info sessions and not just doing like a you know presentation around like the definition can be really impactful. Um, and I have more experience, you know, working with like new Americans, and that that really resonates um, because people see themselves and other and other farmers and that come from countries, you know, um, where they've done they've done this work um, previously. So something else to consider if you have that option, no, depending on where you live. Yeah, and I guess related to that is also um, some of the incubators out here. They do field trips to farms and just maybe ensuring that a worker cooperative farm or a farm that is a part of an agricultural cooperative, you know, is included in um, the, the set of tours that you're doing. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, I know a lot of incubator farms try and have a visiting um, farm business come in at least once during like the business planning or some of the off season like curriculum pieces. So incorporating a cooperative farm in that could be a really powerful way to illuminate that possibility. Um, one more question that um, I have is, what are some indications that a farmer might be a good candidate for a cooperative? Like, I think we see people at all different levels of readiness for farming independently come through incubators. And I'm wondering if there's any sort of like characteristics of people that may be successful in farming, whether it's their like goals related to their business or their propensity to work like well with other people. Are there certain ways that incubator farm staff could um, identify participants in their program that might be a good fit for this opportunity? Um, yeah, um, I certainly, I think maybe there are some people who are flagged for being less inclined or like less suitable. Um, so overall, it's like, you know, anyone could be a part of a co-op. We're all used to working with other people in some aspect of our lives or, you know, um, but people who might um, have really strong ideas and um, not be able to seem to to listen to others well um, or is not open to, um, yeah, incorporating new ideas from other people, like those would be flags for people who might not be a good fit and could use some assistance and training on communication skills um, and collaboration um, but otherwise you know it's, it's, it's um, the idea of cooperation isn't totally foreign to us in our day-to-day -day, right so um, supporting that accentuating kind of the ways that people are already um, collaborating be it like seeing noticing when people are um, apt to sharing with others or if there are some who are that you notice are just really proactive and good conveners and always just able to quickly notice issues and try to address them um, either themselves or with others. You know, those are certainly good uh, qualities to have for a cooperative, but also again, just in life, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Vanessa and Mai, it looks like we're having a little bit of a connection issue from your end, um, so we'll give it a moment here to let things um, reconnect, and then we have a couple more questions before we finish.
Sorry for the interruption, everyone. Hopefully we'll be connected soon. It looks like there's something happening on their end. Just a minute. And Vanessa and Mai, if you can hear me, um, if you switch off your video, uh, oftentimes that'll help resolve this. So if you can just turn off the video sharing option. All right, in the, in the meantime, we can answer a couple questions here on the, um, that have arisen in the chat. So questions about where are the resources that were mentioned, like the farm equipment sharing. Um, is it on the California Center for Cooperative Development website? Um, one of the links that Vanessa shared um, that I copied and pasted into the chat will answer questions on equipment sharing. Um, and then all of the um, Resources that were discussed or linked in the presentation today will be included in a follow-up email. Um, and then one thing to note, just as um, Vanessa and Mai seem to be reconnecting, um, is that this webinar is actually part of a series. So um, Vanessa and Mai um, are working with NIFTY to develop a two-webinar series. The second webinar will be on February 23rd from 1 to 2.30. And the content for this webinar um, will be designed around um, responses from the evaluation survey for the webinar today. And the intention is that we're moving kind of along into a deeper understanding of cooperative opportunities on the incubator. And then after this second webinar that's held on the 23rd, um, there will be the opportunity opened for folks who are working with farmers for whom this seems like a really good fit um, to become involved with uh, cooperative development specialists um, as connected through Vanessa and Mai, um, and hopefully receive some TA around how to actualize some of this for the farmers in your site. So um, with that said, I really encourage everyone to go ahead and complete the evaluation for today, particularly if you're interested in going deeper into this topic with Vanessa and Mai on the next um, webinar on the 23rd. Um, so it looks like Vanessa has logged off, so it's a bit of a like anticlimactic end to the webinar, and there are a couple questions that remain to be answered, but what I'll do is go ahead and share those with Vanessa and Mai, um, and we will uh, hopefully have answers to those that we can send around. Um, so with that, I will just say thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the NIFTI website, it's nesfp.org slash NIFTI. And again, please take time to fill out the evaluation for the webinar today and share your input on what you'd like the second webinar in this series to be about. Again, that'll be designed as a deeper dive into how to work to fold cooperative opportunities into the education that you're providing on your incubator farm. So uh, yes, the evaluation will be coming via email. Uh, later today. So thanks to everyone for joining and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.